And joining me for more is David Swanson, author of this book right here, When the World Outlaw Outlawed War. David, just how big of an impact do conservative think tanks have on drumming up support for war? A tremendous impact, uh, and they carry this agenda forward on a plan that uh, spans decades, and they proceed with a similar agenda as presidents and congresses of the two parties come and go, and they rotate their own staffers and think tankers in and out of official government positions and back to the think tank. Uh, these are the people who led the destruction of welfare as we knew it uh, during the Clinton years. They are for small government, meaning small non-military government. Uh, they led the, the driving of the, of the national debt and the military spending uh, when Reagan was president. They don't have a problem with reckless spending and deficits. They have a problem with spending money on anything other than the military or wars, and they completely own uh, Congress. And why do they, or you say, why, why do they continue to push this agenda, in your opinion? Um, and, and who stands to benefit from, from going to war? Well, going to war with nations with huge oil supplies uh, has been a, a desire of the oil corporations for decades. Uh, going to war with a privatized military and a very profitable military industrial complex is a money making machine for certain interests. Uh, and there are those who think it's politically advantageous and uh, strategically beneficial to be building more bases in more countries. Uh, the reasons uh, that, that we go into these wars are often numerous. They just don't include the ones we are told, such as suspicions of, of nuclear programs and so forth. And a report just came out today which um, supposedly provides some justification for going to war with Iran, with Iran, um, the UK now preparing to go to war, the US also preparing to go to war. To what extent do you think that we're seeing the same thing behind this report um, as far as this, this push um, from these organizations um, to go to war? Well, I think the, the, if you mean the same thing as around 2002, 2003, I think it's very similar, but I think the bar has been lowered. They, they, you're not required any longer to claim that they actually have nukes and are about to bomb us within 45 minutes. You can now get away with just claiming that, that they're working on programs and they might get there someday uh, and that we need to go in uh, preemptively. And if it's done in a way that uh, risks few U.S. lives, Lives and relatively few U.S. dollars, uh, there may be little resistance. Certainly there is no congressional resistance uh, to going to war without Congress as we've seen with Libya. So there was no need to, to go through the same routine of lying to Congress that, uh, that Bush and Cheney bothered with. And David, according to the Heritage Foundation website, in 2009, they raked in a revenue of over $88 million. Who is funding this organization, and what does it tell you about the power that they have in Washington? Well, these are our modern robber barons of this new gilded age. It was the cores and the scafies that started this uh, and similar institutions that have been well funded for basically my lifetime. Uh, and it is the funding of the upper 1%. This is the target of the movement uh, of 99% occupying our cities. This is the agenda of the extremely wealthy elite uh, that has put up this giant building uh, across a parking lot from the U.S. Senate office buildings with its own hotel and its own video studios and everything you could want in there. It looks like another U.S. Senate office building, uh, and it has as much power, perhaps, as the other ones. And um, you, we mentioned your new book that you have out, and you really discuss, you zero in on the on war, the illeg illegality behind war. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how, on the flip side, it's become more mainstream and acceptable to go to war? Yeah, you, you mentioned John Yu's uh, memos in that clip, and this is somebody who would pull out vetoes that were overridden, speeches that were given, uh, notes that were made in the margins of court rulings, and claim to have something legal. 
Whereas on the side of peace and justice, we have actual laws. We have the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which was ratified by the U.S. Senate, 85 to 1, in January 1929. And no one remembers it, but we are a party to it, and so is Iran, and so are most of the nations of the world, and it forbids war, any, any use of war, no matter how beneficial or humanitarian or defensive you claim it might be. War was to be eliminated by this treaty, which is still on the books, still on the State Department's website, uh, and we are not complying with it. Uh, I, I don't think by reminding people of this, I'll end war by next week, but I think we need to look back to how we got there and why we've forgotten it and how people like the Heritage Foundation have so dominated our discourse that we can't even talk about it anymore. And David, um, you just came from D.C. where you've been pro protesting for quite a while. Um, we're seeing these Occupy Wall Street protests. Um, you were at that Stop the Machine protest. Um, do you think that we are now seeing a backlash? Um, you know, corporate greed is one of the big things that they're protesting against. And um, we are seeing this anti-war message. Um, do you think that um, amid all these protests that we're seeing that the message is getting out there and then people are starting to take notice and really um, stand up against these these powers? We've seen changes in the, the topics of discussion in the corporate media in this country and in Congress, uh, and we've seen changes in the polling of, of what people think of inequality and of the fairness of this hoarding of wealth by this in extremely wealthy elite. So the, the culture is changing slowly. Uh, whether we can change Congress in time to impact the super committee's decisions uh, is a much bigger hurdle. This is this is slow movement, but we are certainly seeing progress. And in Freedom Plaza tomorrow, the occupation will be holding its own super committee hearing where such topics as ending wars and taxing the rich will be permitted, unlike on Capitol Hill, where we get arrested for mentioning such things. David, thanks so much for your thoughts on this. Pleasure to have you on. That was David Swanson, author of the book, When the World Outlawed War.